여러분들 반갑습니다. 안녕하십니까? It is wonderful to see all of you this afternoon. Thank you for your invitation. And um, as you know, the title of our Dharma talk today is What is your original face? First of all, we should go back a little bit in history to understand what this really is and where it comes from. Most of you know it, but for those who don't, let me just briefly recap the story. So, as history has it, we had a fantastic monk who was not yet a monk when he got transmission. His name was Henung Sunim in Korean, Hui Nang in Chinese, and he's known as the sixth patriarch in the West. So, when he got transmission, he had to escape because he was so young and he was so uninitiated by the view of others into the tradition that it was simply inconceivable that he would get transmission at such a young age and in such a kind of non-existent monastic status. So, the fifth patriarch gave him secret transmission and Henning Sunim was quickly on his way. But by the morning, many, many monks found out that this happened. And Haim Yong Sunim, who was a soldier before, he quickly sped up and tried to catch the sixth patriarch and grab the kasa and the Buddha's bow from him. So it took him about a day to catch up with Hui Neng. But when he eventually did, the sixth patriarch put the robe and the bowl on a rock and said, all these objects symbolize true faith. How could they be removed by force? So then he hid himself. And then, as Haim Yong Sunim just saw that, he said, wow, that's what I came here for. He tries to grab the ball and the kasa, but they don't move as if they were fused with the rock itself. Then he got really frightened. And he, something started to open in him. And he says, younger brother, please come along. I will not harm you. So Hui Neng comes out. It took a big leap of faith for him to do so. And then Haim Young says, younger brother, I came here for the Dharma not for the robe and the bow. Then, Hui Neng says, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? Haim Young heard that, got enlightenment. And he asks, besides this, which is true and profound, did you get any other secret teaching from the fifth patriarch? Then Hui Neng says, that which I have said, is not secret and is complete. If you practice, we can all attain this. Then Haim Young says, then let me become your student. Then Hui Neng says, if you have this kind of mind, then we are both the students of the fifth patriarch. Go with peace. And then they parted ways. Hui Neng later ascended to the position of the sixth patriarch, and he actually got ordained as a monk in Namvasa about 17 years after this event. So, so much about history. But what is the actual meaning of what is your original face for us today? When you wake up in the morning, you see one face in the mirror. When you go to the bathroom and prepare for the day, you see another face. When you are in your office or do your job, you see another face. And although the basic outlines are the same, the expression is not the same. And you go back home in the evening, and then you present yourself to your family, and then that's another face. Which one is your true face? In our complex world, we have to assume so many roles in our lives. So, if you look at yourself as a layperson, you have to be sometimes a father, a husband, a salesman, an agent, a director, or as a woman, a mother, a wife, a housewife, um, 
a partner, uh, a salesperson, many, many roles to play. Which one is your true self? First of all, the most important part of the Six Patriarchs teaching is not just the question, but the phrase before that, when you don't think of good and bad. To carry it further, when you don't think of any dualities like me and you, or this or that, high or low, when you do not think in terms of dualities, what is your true face, true nature? Now, this is something which we cannot answer just verbally. All of you are part of the International Dharma Instructors Association, which is wonderful. You have read more books than I could ever do. But how much do we practice together in order to attain the true meaning of the Sixth Patriarch's question? Some people may not remember the connection between Huineng's question and the Huadu Suheng that we are doing to the present day in Korea, for which I feel really fortunate. Because, simply put, this phrase became what is your original face, then what is this? So our Kanhua Son, which has this keyword, Ige Mo Shinga, what is this? And turns your energy inwards and finds a non-judgmental, non-dualistic, clear like mirror, clear like space mind, that comes from the Sixth Patriarch. Of course, on Huangmei Mountain, Yukcho Desa was teaching this for a long time. And over time, the tradition forked into many, many Mahayana versions. And of course, Buddhists have sometimes bitter memories of the Yi dynasty, which came soon after the Shilla. But the Yi dynasty, with its very conservative attitude, confining monks just to the mountains, not allowing them to do anything else, just to practice. Sometimes they couldn't even teach in the cities. Only ceremonies. That was for the masses and also some sutras that kind of helped society. This kind of conservative behavior was an indispensable asset for our Chamson Suheng or correct meditation practice to, say, to stay clear that it doesn't go into varieties, it doesn't differentiate, it doesn't become explanation, it doesn't become just books and speech and lectures. There's an old Chinese saying that if you read one book, you have to take 10,000 steps. So much experience is necessary. And look at the way our consciousness works. What you think of as I, as your conscious personality, is truly about 5% of what you are carrying within your palshik or storehouse consciousness. Now, that is truly something to see. And when we meditate, as a side effect, we can see what we have never seen within ourselves. That's part of our face. That's part of our karma, our personality that we have not seen. But that's not our true nature. What is really important for us to understand that during correct meditation practice, you turn off the sixth, the intellect, the seventh, the judgments and discrimination, and you also supersede the eighth, the storehouse consciousness, in Sanskrit alaya, or in Korean paishik, the eighth consciousness. None of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is your true self. None of these is your true face. Now, when we meditate and use this question and return to our Tantian, then the content of the upper centers of thinking, speech, and feelings, they cannot control us. Then we return before thinking, before any dualities, in Korean, Turi Omnun Maum. That's really important. Because any other method, which puts an object into your consciousness, should that be an image or a sound. Remember the Diamond Sutra. The Diamond Sutra says very clearly that if you find the Buddha in any form or any sound, you are not going the right path. 
So use the Yom Bull, use the mantras, but don't stop there. Use the images of the Buddha. Some traditions have beautiful visualization practices, but they also do not stop there and attain where the sound comes from, where the image comes from. So suppose we make this great effort and train and practice and attain our true face. What's next? Well, next is what we call clear everyday life. Whether as a layperson or a monk, it doesn't matter in that sense. What matters is the quality of our lives. So, correct recognition of our situation, correct relationship, and correct function. Then, when necessary, you are a housewife. When necessary, a mother. When necessary, a wonderful cook. And for the gentleman, their own roles. A, a good driver, or someone who sets up the holiday schedule for the family, and plans for Chusok, you know. So, if we do not identify with any of our karma, then we can use all our karma very, very, very well. And this may seem to be a contradiction, but let me explain that to you with a very quick and clear metaphor. Most of us are attached to something we call I, or person, within ourselves. And that's okay. We were conditioned to do that. We have a self-image, and we think that's us. That's all right. It's like being attached to the cup. Why? This uh, mug is very important. It has tea in it. I like tea. I want to drink. So I grab the handle very strongly so that I don't spill it. And eventually it would arrive from the little plate to my lips. But if I'm attached to the mug, then if I want to make a phone call, I cannot do that. I have to attain freedom from my beloved mug and take the phone and dial the number. So many people who are attached to their own self-image, to only one face, to only one aspect of their personality, they remain stuck within their own box. And they don't attain the freedom, they don't attain the original face which has no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. When we do that, there's another danger. We truly experience our empty hand. And we come to like it. We love freedom. So we say, okay, I'm not attached to the mug. I'm not attached to the phone. I'm not attached to the, to the cap, you know? So then we have a problem. When you want to drink, you cannot grab the cup or the mug because you're attached to your empty hand. Or when you want to grab the phone, you also cannot do that because you're attached to your freedom. So the first problem is called attachment to form. The next problem is called attachment to emptiness. Both are equally a problem because they render you dysfunctional. In our human life, we experience extremes. Many, many, many times we experience extremes. Sometimes we are attached to something or somebody so much that we identify our lives with it. And sometimes, when we have pain and suffering out of this attachment, we put everything down, everything, everything, everything. Recite a lot of sutras, do a lot of suhang and meditation, and then we attain freedom. But then, we become attached to our freedom. And rem remember, your original face has no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no life, no death. But we are alive. We are in a body. We have to perform our duties. We have to walk the path of this incarnation. And because of that, this moment is very important. So this moment, what is my correct situation? This moment, what is my correct relationship? This moment, what is my correct function? So attaining our Original face means completely arriving at this moment. In fact, the Buddha has a name, Tathagata, the one who has come. But where? Right here. Right now. So the one who attains the moment, the one who has truly arrived, 
that's your original face, that's our original mind. And just like your bathroom mirror, this original mind is capable of everything. Originally it has no hindrance. But we experience cause and effect by our own actions, thinking, speech and emotions. And it's our job to see clearly in our mind mirror where these four channels are headed. If we have a simple and clear direction in our lives, then our speech, our thinking, our emotions and our actions, they go to the same direction. They will never be the same. We are imperfect. We are humans. But if they don't go the same direction, we lose our integrity, then we lose our energy, and then the world doesn't believe us, and then doesn't recognize us, and then we fall apart. Now, if you look at your own crises, why did those crises appear? Because we wanted either too much or too little, and we couldn't set our hands free from the many things that we grabbed, or we couldn't give up our own emptiness. So, these two extremes are very important teaching to be truly who you are. So at first, when we say, get rid of your ego, get rid of your I, my, me, it's a very important teaching to lose the image, the illusion, the false idea of your true face. But the next step after you attained freedom is how to use that freedom correctly. All right? So, before I take any questions, one last story. Everybody knows Ho Tei, the Chinese monk with the big belly, long ears, and uh, he's just under the shade of a tree and children love him, they're hanging all over him. So he's like the Santa Claus of uh, Buddhism. And one day, a bright-eyed young monk is going up the mountain for his 100-day retreat, and he meets Hote, who was coming down. And he says, Ah, Hwasang, how wonderful, how lucky, how good karma this is, that I can meet you. Please, teach me. I'm going up to do an arduous 100-day solo retreat. How should I do it? And as you know, Hote always had a big, big bag on his back full of gifts for the kids and suddenly he just lets go of the bag and he thumps down on the road. The monk immediately understood and thanked him profusely. And next thing is he asks the second question, Sunim, if I attain this, then what? Then Hotei picks up the bag, puts it on his shoulder and walks down the mountain. That's how it is when you attain your original face and also live your life very, very clearly. And who might have any questions, please feel free to ask. So this morning, I killed a cockroach, big cockroach. So, so I felt very guilty about that because be before I didn't uh, feel guilty about uh, killing the, some um, kind of this cockroach, but nowadays, I felt guilty, so it is any relationship to uh, feeling of Buddhism or something? Oh yes, there is. Uh, we have many vows, many precepts, and one of them in the Oge, the five precepts, is that we refuse to take any life. And uh, you see over time that it's not possible to 100% keep that. Even if you breathe, and we all have to breathe. We are burning viruses and bacillus in our lungs all the time. So just as you breathe, this kind of burning process kills these small little sentient beings. If you go to any rice field, you see a huge amount of earthworms. All those living beings that are under the plow when the rice field is prepared for the paddies. So in agriculture, you are in nature seeing how the creation and destruction works. And when you're living in the city, sometimes you kill rats and cockroaches and other intruders because you don't want to live with them. We consider them unhealthy 
and dirty and all kinds of problems can appear. So there are a couple of ground rules to this. One is people should not take joy in killing. Some people do. Some people have this kind of vindictive mind that I win, I'm stronger than the cockroach, you know? That's very bad karma. Number two, try to do this in a way that takes the least consciousness away. So hunting for sports is very different than just, you know, clearing your house from ants. Or killing a large number of fish or picking up just mushrooms, which the Indians consider living beings, they are very different karma. If you have to do this, and sometimes we all have to do it, let's face it, then our number one job is A, not to judge ourselves or the cockroach about that, two, chant some mantra like Namu Amitabho to balance it out and give some peace to that consciousness that we separated from the body. It's the same thing when you eat meat. I mean, when you go to any shiktang or restaurant, you don't see people just reciting a few mantras before they start their bulgogi or sokogi, you know? But they should. If their bodies require meat, then they have to balance out that act or the participation in killing with some correct spiritual practice that takes care of that consciousness that we separated from the body for our own reasons. I'm trying to be realistic here. We can do this practice, but most of humanity cannot live without eating meat. Or we cannot live without killing cockroaches or mice or rats. So wherever we draw the line, we cannot 100% fulfill these requirements. So the rules help us keep a harmonious, balanced, and non-dualistic mind about it, and not to cover our own eyes and our own ears. Let's face it, when we kill an animal, that animal doesn't want to die. Whether dog, or pig, or cow, they don't want to die. So they want revenge through anger. They want to protect themselves. And if it doesn't work, of course they die, but all these emotions are coded into the meat through hormones and other chemicals. Not to mention all the antibiotics that current agriculture and the grazing technologies, you know, put into the body of the animals. So this kind of problem goes very deep. And we eat that meat and it modifies our bodies and minds. Mostly we don't notice it because it's very, very little over time. You don't become different just because you ate some pork for dinner. But if you do this for 20, 30 years, you can see your face in the mirror that it changed. It is changing based on the food and energy and information that you put into the body. When you have to kill a, a cockroach, kill without thinking, and when you register that this had to happen, then chant some mantra and uh, repent for this act. And then there is some balance, way better than without it. We cannot reverse it, we cannot, should not multiply it, these kinds of actions, but there is a way to appease that energy. As I understand, you said, uh, the, we, when you meet, when you eat meat, to pray something to, like, a, uh, like the Amitabha. Yes. To Chant some mantra of, of compassion animals. or repentance. Mm -hmm. Nama Amitabha actually sends the animal energy to higher realms, like pure land, we say. But what is pure land? Pure land is a myth. But not to be stuck in the earthly realm or not to be attached to a human, that's what this mantra does. But not too many often. It should be. Yeah, Just not too, I mean, not too often, as we spoke about eating meat. You know, in Hungary and Korea, until the 1950s, it was usual, especially in the countryside, to have meat once a week. Once a week. Now, most of the civilized people have it three times a day or twice a day, you know. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Um, I try to understand your dharma today, but it's not easy to me because anyway, uh, so I want to check my understanding about your dharma talk. So 
you said finally anyway we don't need to about what is the original face of mind right because uh, the uh, the more important thing is uh, the function right uh, equally no? important equally important if you do not attain the essence if you do not attain your true nature then there is no foundation for correct function look at humanity what have we been doing in the last five ten thousand years just as much as we can see back in history we've been here tens of thousands of years but the visible past reveals something truly truly sad we never really got it we never really got who we are why we are here otherwise we wouldn't be doing these things to each other and to this planet so this major cloud of ignorance that we have is the problem all these dualistic ideas attachments and our self-image and our true self they are so far away that this gap is the source this huge gate of suffering now that's why we cannot function correctly and that's why buddhism and any any spiritual path i wouldn't call it religion religion is a totally different cup of tea any spiritual path that turns your energy inwards first clear off this mirror first attain your true nature first attain the true nature of this world first is the key for proper function we have tried so much we have had so many religions ideologies politics social ideas all kinds of stuff and they were either short-lived or went downright to disaster you mean like easily distracted right easily misled and then we went into extremes to change the world so that our thinking would fit in you see 20th century with all the socialist and communist ideologies is a very good example the remnant of that is 80 kilometers north of here they have an ideology a way of thinking which doesn't really match the way nature and humans could actually function this is really painful that if we do not practice no matter what we think no matter how we feel we don't perceive cause and effect so there's a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions so those uh, intelligent gentlemen over a hundred years ago who worked out communist ideology they were very very smart but they didn't see a few things and because of that lack of insight because of that ignorance tens of millions of people died so that's how it functioned it functioned in the soviet union for over 70 years in central eastern europe over 40 45 years just next door in the north it's been there three generations okay we are looking at the third generation and they are functioning but how how what are we doing to each other so function relationship and situation how we see our situation whether it's correct or not whether we establish correct relationship or not whether we function correctly or not all depends on our clarity of mind translation whether we see our true face or not how about the simply like a be aware and then be mindful and then be concentrated that's a good start right? okay. that's a good start okay. attaining this moment okay. is a very very good start because in this moment you have all the karmas of past present and future all of it so if you just focus on this moment you become clear perceive the sound of the bus or the lights or just see the color of the cushions and the mats and then that's a good start to see cause and effect also inside so Sonbulgyo or in Zen uh, has wonderful tools and assets one is that we are using our sensory perceptions to progress on the path we don't block them out we don't say that this is wrong we don't say this is illusory we take them as they are in Sanskrit it's called tathata or suchness so the sound of the bus is neither good nor bad it just goes that's what it does so if you see everything as it is if you see human nature as it is we arrive to our essence to our true nature very very quickly because we stop judging we stop making dualistic ideas 
That's the point. So then the function will also be clear, but if you only want to fix the function manually, one function controlling another function, another function, another function, then soon, soon you are at the level of having multiple layers of thinking, multiple layers of intelligence, and then there will be a master class, like an artificial intelligence, that controls everything. And we are actually heading that way very quickly. So if we cannot handle ourselves, if we cannot understand by ourselves what we are, who we are, where our emotions come from, how our thinking works, we will delegate that task to an artificial entity because that will understand us better, we think, than we do. That will handle our problems better than we do. That will never happen. So, Computers can remember much better than you and I because you press a button and whatever document you created 10 years ago, it's there, loud and clear. But that will never solve real human problems. It can give us some help, but not the solution. So that's why it's so important to attain the source, the very source, where our function comes from, where our thoughts, feelings, perceptions, impulses and consciousness come from. That's why the clear and simple teaching of Yukcho Desa, or Hui Neng, is so important. Read the Platform Sutra. It's short. It's wonderful. It's enjoyable. Platform Sutra is the summary of his teachings. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Okay. I visited Myanmar several times, and I found that Vipassana is very popular over there. Can we practice Vipassana and the Zen? at the same time? No. Vipassana and Zen are like uh, KTX and ITX. So they are very good trains, but you can board only one of them at the same time. Both of them will take you to Dongtegu. It's fine. But choose the method after you explored all of that. So I have seen many Westerners who wanted the best of Tibetan Buddhism, the best of Japanese Buddhism, the best of Chinese and Korean and uh, sometimes Theravada. And these very intelligent people got very confused in a few years. Super confused. Because their idea of efficiency actually led them to ruin. Because they took too many snacks from too many plates and they spoiled their own stomach. So it's not necessary to practice traditions together and at the same time. I mean, how many minds do you have? You have a Zen mind, you have a Vipassana mind, you have a Tibetan Buddhist mind. It's like, that doesn't exist. We have one mind only. But we have all different karmas. So depending on the kind of karma we have, we can say, oh, I don't like this and this type of Buddhism. I like the other better. Then you sort it out. You have your tradition, your teacher, your Dejung, the Sangha, together. You practice 10 years and you realize, uh-oh, these traditions are all about the same point. Only my like and dislike mind differentiates them. And that's okay. We can and we should accept that. Nobody should be forced to practice something they cannot connect with. So when that happens, then you know. First, you do shopping. You go to latte backwajom and you go from floor to floor and then you say okay i want this pair of shoes just this then you buy those shoes and you wear them for many 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 years same thing with tradition i always encourage my students wherever they are look very carefully and choose for yourself a teacher you can trust a teaching you can believe in and a sangha or students group where you fit in why? Free will is the ultimate power. If you don't believe in something or someone, you don't want that. <clears throat> then you will have 20-30% of the usual output, then soon turn away, do something else. So we should look around. We should respect all the varieties that we have. But you can use only one method, and the simpler the better. You have talked about the artificial intellect. You, you, and these days, some scholars say artificial intellect can be God. So I basically can be I, God. Can be God. 
Really? So, That's what, a very what, interesting so, concept. I haven't heard that. So, uh, I read a book named The Sapiens. Uh, By uh, Yuval, Yuval Noah Harari. Yuval Harari, yes. Very yes. intelligent can, man. Uh, perhaps the, by artificial intellect, we can be God. So I have a doubt, but I, I also feel perhaps it's possible our mind can enter into motion. And that's I want to ask you, what is the basic difference, the function of artificial intellect and the function of uh, our mind. Oh, quite a lot. If we understand the same thing under AI, artificial intelligence, then that entity does not make the same kind of mistakes as we do. It's just an extension of human consciousness as long as it depends on us and it does not become autonomous. If it becomes autonomous, like an entity upon itself, then we have a problem. It's called the singularity. So if you're interested in that, you can read Ray Kurzweil. He's very much into the subject. And um, he wrote a book called The Singularity is Near. The prognosis is like 2028, when we can produce something which is as intelligent as human or more and becomes autonomous. You can talk to it. It becomes self-taught. It becomes kind of independent. But there will be huge differences. It will have a silicon-based, you know, uh, substrate, like an, a, an environment, or metallic body, or plastic-based body. We will always have this carbon-based body. This, this body has so many problems that we never want an artificial intelligence to have the same thing as we do, because then you have to take it to the dentist all the time. So <laughs> that's not good, you know? And we know where artificial intelligence comes from because we make it. But we don't know where we come from. Who made us or what made us. Yeah, people can say God or mind made it. Avatamsaka Sutra or Hwam Kyung says, if you want to understand the universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. You know, then monotheistic views, many of them, they say, God created this universe, but they all have a different idea of God. In Buddhism, we have a pretty much overlapping image of mind, but do we attain it? Do we really experience it? The real question is, do we see our origin? Do we see where we come from? Do we really perceive the source? Moment to moment, the source is here and now, not in the past. The source is actually what is listening in you, what is understanding my speech in you, what is using your eyes to see, ears to hear. It's completely no name, no form. You cannot know it, but you can experience it. That's our practice. AI will never have that. AI will not have the problem of being just zero and one because it doesn't have Buddha nature. It doesn't want to get enlightenment. It doesn't have a problem of suffering because it's created in a way that it doesn't experience suffering. It experiences malfunctions that it can fix. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a problem of impermanence, imperfection and interdependence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it needs energy. It has connection with other entities, human, non-human. Mm -hmm. But the problem or the set of problems that humans, us, face, mm -hmm. AI doesn't face that. And that's why if it becomes autonomous and self-taught and keeps learning and attaining more and more and more, it can become very dangerous for us because it can treat humanity just as the sickness of planet Earth and that wouldn't be far from the truth. The actual problem would be that AI would want to fix it and doesn't give us the right to fix it. And then we could see some pretty ugly things, you know compared to which the two world wars were just parties, just starters, you know. AI is an interesting thing. I always ask, it's okay, but can you switch it off? Mm -hmm. If you can switch it off, no problem. But if you cannot switch it off, watch out. <laughs> More questions? Thank you for your teachings. So I wonder how uh, you lead the meditation, your meditation. So uh, if you can, so I'm trying to have some experience with your meditation right here and right time. 
so it's not a question. It should be a question. Don't be so stubborn, okay? <laughs> Ask a question, then you get an answer. Okay. So meditation is important for all of us, and uh, we do it in a group. All right? So this group meditation is number one important. Why? A uh, human being is the most interesting animal on earth. We can be very selfish and very selfless, very independent and also very much attached to relationships. We can do both. We can go both ways. If we experience one extreme, it's very likely we have to experience the other just for fun. We want that. We are curious. We are unpredictable. We love to play. We want something new, whereas we don't know what it is just to depart from the old one, something that kind of kept us captive so far. But with meditation, it's a usual experience that we have to start together with the Sangha, with the Dejung. Otherwise, we can go wrong. How do we know this? In the West, and maybe also in the East, when Buddhism started, many people just read the books, and they went into their rooms and they meditated for a few months or maybe even a few years. Now, that was either coming out very well and the person became super clear because the understanding of the sutras or the teaching was already clear. But if the understanding of the instructions was not clear, then they go whoosh, totally the wrong path, sometimes even to mental hospital. So the Sangha, the group, is actually keeping everybody, if the teaching and teacher are right, to attach to their own opinions, and that's number one important. So if the community, the group, prevents you from being attached to your own opinion, your meditation will go the right way. If your meditation practice reinforces your own opinion, then your ego will become stronger, bigger, faster, and you will be more and more righteous about yourself and the world. Now that's a killer. That's actually the pathway to self-destruction and maybe other types of destruction too. So when you practice enough in a group and your teacher says you do solo retreat, then you do that. Now that's really important because if you go the other way, then it either becomes enlightenment or death, or just going crazy. Why am I saying this? Sung San Sanin was a very, very young monk when he did his 100-day solo retreat near Magoksa. I saw the place, and uh, I couldn't believe he was there for 100 days. There's nothing there except a little stream and a very small pond where he got his water and the, and the shack. That was it. And when he started this really strong Debiju or Great Dharani practice, and uh, first ate just powdered pine needles, then soybeans after like one or two months, swallowing them whole and then it was coming out whole also. Nothing more. Two spoonfuls of powdered pine needles and that's it. Uh, it was a very uh, kind of seriously risky Taoist practice, Taoist and Buddhist practice together. It was dehydrating the body very, very severely, but slowly. And you were still chanting. He was chanting 20 hours a day. No other food. So, at that time, most monks knew what this practice was. In fact, he got instructions from a se <coughs> senior monk how to do this. He didn't just get started reading a book. But he was just a few months into monastic tradition and then he goes up there and he wants to try his best. And this elder monk told him, okay, now you know what to do, now you know how to do it. But listen to me very carefully. You will have three outcomes out of this, no other. Either you go crazy, you die, or you get enlightenment. Never forget this. And Sung San Sinim got enlightenment. But not everyone does. I have seen Dharma accidents after very, very strong practice just because the start wasn't clear, just because the teaching that the person got wasn't complete enough relatively, just because they didn't get the technical instructions 
sufficiently how to meditate and most important they didn't put down their opinions first so when you practice with other people sometimes ah too noisy moving uh, I don't like him I don't like her this is all clearing up when you practice a few years in a meditation group so Sansam used to say put it all down don't hold your opinion don't hold your I my me put it down when you do that correct situation relationship function all appear so that's why when the time comes solo practice also comes and then you can improve that skill too without that without this purification or cleansing first it can be very dangerous okay i really appreciate your wonderful attention this afternoon and uh, sincerely hope to meet you again in the subsequent months and years so that we could share the dharma and make another step in our joint practice to attain enlightenment and save all beings from suffering thank you very much